Testing one, two, three. Oh, don't, doesn't my voice sound lovely? I would like to welcome all of you to St. Mark's Episcopal Church. Uh, and I really want to thank my colleagues for coming here. We got a Lutheran, Joanne, please stand. And she is not going to be offended because she leaves early, but she has another appointment and she was willing to come here if she could go first. Lynn from Presbyterian Church, Dan. United Methodist Church, West River of Life. And we got uh, Reverend Laura, will you stand up? <laughs> and I'm Jim Schumard. We do have a little fun here, but tonight you're gonna wonder why do we call this Good Friday? Hello, why do we call this Good Friday? We used to call it Black Friday. These are my father's vestments and this is the only day I can wear them. So that's why I wore this. Uh, and now I'm going to ask my colleagues why it's called Good Friday instead of Black Friday. Any offerings? Yes, ma'am. If we didn't have Good Friday, we wouldn't have the resurrection. And I believe that's basically the answer. If I'm hitting, getting head nods here. Any scholars over here that would counter that? Oh, no, that's cool. It was called God's Friday. And that's like, uh, goodbye is like God. Wow. Okay, see, I knew we had a scholar here and we had heads nodding as well. Um, just to give you, bring you up to date, usually on Good Friday, we'll read the whole passion narrative. Uh, but we're doing the seven last words. And we say the seven last words of Jesus, uh, there are a paragraph around each one, it's, it's really the seven last phrases or statements from Jesus on the cross across all four Gospels. Jesus has been arrested. He's prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, arrested, betrayed, deserted, denied by Peter outside the trial with the religious authorities, and then he has a trial with Pilate, and he's scourged and tortured, and he carries his cross the Golgotha, and that is where we begin tonight. And we will begin with the first reflection. Always telling me what to do. So I'm going to tell them what to do. Read first, reflect second. Oh, I like this. It's a very uh, high holy day in the life of the church. So let's just take a moment of silence for about 30 seconds, Nancy, and center your hearts, center your minds, center your guts, because this day is about, it's a gutsy day today. I thirst. When Jesus knew that all was finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. We're gathered all together as a community of believers on Good Friday. Of course, we are always one in Christ. Even those who wouldn't say, I'm a Christian, so often follow Christ and his sayings 
closer than many of us do, especially the clergy. We never know exactly what's going to happen next. I appreciate Nancy having read this text. Jesus said, I'm thirsty. You know, he was born the child of Mary. He was born the Son of God. As the Gospel of John opens, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And yet this man felt pain. He felt hunger and thirst and loneliness and abandonment. All of us have physical bodies, just as Christ had. We need air, water, good food, family, loving relationships of some kind, and we all need work. We all feel pain and abandonment. For Jesus, having been nailed to the cross, being accompanied at a distance by some friends, some women, and the beloved disciple, Jesus still had more to say to us that is meaningful for our lives today. God made flesh, Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, spoke from what would be some sort of a preparation for his ascension. And certainly, as Father said, there is no resurrection without Good Friday. No Easter without this day when we spend time considering the scriptures and the words, I thirst. You know, Christ commented that this was a fulfillment of scripture, and I would like to encourage you to look at it from this point of view. There's no real agreement on this. But if the scripture being fulfilled is Psalm 69, then it is not an act of compassion being done for Christ. Rather, something toxic like vinegar and that's the scripture from psalm 69 i encourage you to look for it and read the whole chapter jesus must have experienced so many painful things by that point because it was almost the point of death when he said i'm thirsty and got no kindness from the soldier at that point. He was thirsty. He was probably having trouble thinking. Isn't that what happens to us when we are dehydrated and thirsty? He most certainly was experiencing pain and anxiety and the stress beyond any we can imagine because the greatest injustice of all time happened when the Son of God was killed on the cross. That's the way I see it. Nevertheless, the tables turned. I'll leave you with that.
Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by, watching, but the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. Thank you for that reading. Pastor Jim said uh, something about guts, I think, earlier. Is that right? Something about, yeah, we need to have a gut, gut check, maybe even. And so uh, I decided to have a gut check this afternoon, and I rewatched the movie The Passion. And so when I share briefly about the phrase, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I can't help now, but picture his state of being when he said that. Beaten, bloodied, and at this point, hanging on the cross, he says these things. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And one of the things that uh, also spoke to me in regards to this this week was a piece of artwork that most of you should have. The title of this piece of artwork, maybe you've seen it before, it's called Forgiven. And as you look at this picture, listen to these words. This painting reveals the heart of God toward me. As I look at the scene, I not only see Jesus wrapping his arms around a fallen man, but I also see him wrapping his arms of mercy around me. My eyes tell me Jesus is holding a broken sinner, but my heart tells me that Jesus is holding me. As I look and wonder, and ponder this painting, there's one message that speaks the loudest to my heart. And it is the overwhelming truth that Jesus loves me as no one else ever could. His suffering, His sacrifice, His death were all for me. When I look at the cross, I never need to question if He loves me. He came for me. He died for me. He lives for me. When I look at his shed blood at the base of that painting on the ground, I never need to question my worth. I'm worth to God the death of his son. A tremendous price has been paid, more than all the riches of all the kingdoms in all the world. And that price was a high price to pay. It was a gory, horrible price that required a lot of shedding of blood. And I read from Romans 
chapter 3, verse 23. Uh, many of us are familiar with this passage. For all have sinned and fall short of God's glorious standard. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Yet now God in His gracious kindness declares us not guilty. He's done this through Christ Jesus who has freed us by taking away our sins. For God sent Jesus to take the punishment of our sins and to satisfy God's anger against us. We are made right with God when we believe that Jesus shed His blood, sacrificing His life for us. And God was being entirely fair and just when He did not punish those who sinned in former times. And He is entirely fair and just in this present time when He declares sinners to be right in His sight because they believe in Jesus and His forgiveness that He said, Father, forgive them. Count yourself one of them. As you look at the painting, it's the man who's holding the hammer and the nail. It's me that's holding the hammer and the nail. It's you who's holding the hammer and the nail. It's us. But as we believe in what Jesus did for us, though we put him there through our sin, he died gladly with joy for us. Romans 4, 7 says, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose sin is no longer counted against them by the Lord. Through Jesus Christ, who said, forgive them. Amen. Today, you will be with me in paradise. One of the criminals who was hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. 
Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. On that cross, so much was laid bare. There was no room for pretension, no room for fancy garments. Three men laid bare on the hardwood of the cross. It is the end, supposedly, for those three. And Jesus, as he's on the cross, Here's once again the temptation that he faced in the wilderness at the beginning of his ministry. If you're the Son of God, cast yourself down and the angels will protect you. If you're the Messiah, call upon the angels and let them come down and rescue you. And now this criminal who sees the end of his life taunts Jesus with similar words. If you're the Messiah, save yourself and save us. And that's a lot of irony there because, in fact, Jesus does save us. There are a number of expressions of faith throughout the Gospels, all four Gospels. One of the ones I hang my hat on is, I believe, help my unbelief. Peter confessing Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God. The, the centurion saying, I have authority, you can heal without even going to the house. But for me, the greatest words of faith in all of Scripture is this criminal who knows how bad he is. His life is seeping out from his body and there's something about Jesus that says this is not the end. There's something about Jesus hanging on the cross saying this is not the end. And only one person besides Jesus gets it. That act of faith, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom is the most powerful expression of faith in Jesus that I've ever read about or heard about. Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The dying criminal is saved. Read the next reading. Oh, well, you're not singing yet. Sit down, sir. Stand up, whoever's reading next. We're doing things twice in this one. But... No? Oh, you're right. I was wrong again. I will sit down. Lord, remember me. Lord, remember me. Lord, remember me when you come into.
Behold your son, behold your mother. Standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Father uh, Thomas George was so um, gracious to write a reflection for tonight. Uh, he is pastor at Our Lady of Fatima Roman Catholic Church, and they have a service tonight. So I'm here to read his reflection. So Jesus, seeing his mother and his disciple whom he loved standing there, said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to his disciple, Behold your mother. These words from the Gospel of John are of tremendous significance because they are among the last words spoken by Jesus before his death. These words demonstrate that Jesus was consistent <clears throat> in his life and in his message until the very end of his life on earth. Even as he suffered agony nailed to the cross, his thoughts and concerns were upon others. Jesus always honored and obeyed the law all through his life, and even at the end he honored the law which required that a firstborn son take care of his mother. Early in his ministry, Jesus emphasized his respect for the law. In St. Matthew's Gospel, he says, Do not think I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He was aware of the fourth commandment, Honor your father and your mother. And just a point of clarification, in the Roman Catholic tradition, uh, that's the fourth commandment. In the more Protestant condition, uh, tradition, uh, honor your father and mother is the fifth commandment. I didn't want you to think I was misquoting scripture here. As Mary's fourth firstborn, Jesus was responsible for his mother's welfare, that she had a place to live and food to eat. Jesus entrusts his mother to John's care, and John takes this commission seriously. From that hour, the disciple takes her into his own home. From this charge, some see Mary being appointed mother of not just his disciple, but of all disciples of Christ, hence of the whole church. This points out to us our duty to our parents. How many of us revere and honor our parents as we should? How many of us are willing to sometimes sacrifice our own well-being to care for our aging parents with love and compassion? How do we reconcile our primary commitment to God without following his call to honor our father and our mother? So let us love our parents and care for them at any cost. But this is the starting point to follow the love command of Jesus, to start with our family. We are also called upon to love our neighbor as ourselves. In these words, to Mary and John, Jesus also signifies that our care and compassion must spread by our service to all people. Just as he asked John to take care of Mary, Jesus in all his teachings tells us to take care of each other. By these words to his mother and disciple, Jesus at the hour of his death asked all of us who follow him to practice our faith by putting into action Christ's example, by serving all people with love, caring, and compassion. To care for another is not a burden, but an opportunity that God gives to witness our faith. Beneath the cross that day, a family was born for Mary and John. But for all of us, true believers, we have become part of the family of God. All of us are brothers and sisters in a true family and fellowship of the redeemed. 
May God bless you this holy season. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, This man is calling Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see if Elijah will come and save him. What words would you like to have on your lips when you pass from this life to the life everlasting? Have you ever thought about that? What words would you like to have on your lips? I think most of us hope we're not swearing. Depending upon the situation, I probably would. But what words are the last words that you'd like to say? Perhaps the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven. How many of you memorized that prayer in the third grade? That's when I remember memorizing it. In Jesus' day, all the kids would memorize a psalm. And the reason for this was so that as they were taking their last gasps of breath, they would have something holy on their lips as they passed from this life into the life everlasting. The scripture they memorized was Psalm 22, and it starts out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from me, helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Matthew and the other authors of the Gospels who recorded the last words of Jesus did not read, need to write the rest of the psalm because everyone in the first couple of centuries knew that as they read this text that Jesus was reciting the psalm that he learned as a youngster. Just as if you or I, you or I were holding the hand of a loved one, and as they were dying, they began to say, Our Father, who art in heaven. We would know the rest of the prayer. And so if you were there to hear Jesus on the cross say the words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Your mind would go through the rest of the psalm. Yet you are holy, Enthroned on the praises of Israel, in you our ancestors trusted. They trusted and they delivered them. To you they cried and you were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not human, scorned by others and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me and they shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth. And since my mother bore me up, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one here to help. Many bulls encircle me, strong bulls of Basham surround me. 
They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint, and my heart is like wax. It is melted in my breast. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws, and you lay me in the dust of death. Dogs are all around me. A company of evildoers encircles me. My hands and feet have shriveled. I can count all my bones, and they stare and gloat over me. And they divide my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far away. O my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul, soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. From the thorns of the wild oxen you have rescued me. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over all the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Bow down before him and all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. Friends, Jesus recited the 22nd Psalm from the cross. Maybe not all of it, we don't know. But those were the words that were on his lips. What would you say? What will your last words be? If you are able to choose them, what will your last words be? Amen.
Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying in a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for this spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Jesus' entire life is teaching, and this moment is no different. As Jesus hangs on the cross, darkness descends, death approaches. The light of the world is being snuffed out. For those who knew him, followed him, and loved him, who are standing at a distance in silence, it is a time of despair a time of grief, a time of defeat. And then Jesus teaches, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Jesus is not defeated. The powers of the world that have put him here in this place at this moment have no real power. The real power lies in his trust the trust of a faithful son in his father. At this moment, he places himself entirely into his father's hands. He surrenders all as he trusts. Jesus doesn't call us to worship him, nor to stand in awe of such trust and surrender. In the 13th chapter of John, Jesus tells his disciples, I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done. This is an instruction to them and to us. Jesus teaches us to follow him in his way, to practice the way. We have seen darkness and death. This last year has been a lesson in it. We are called through his teaching to know that the powers of the world have no real power. The real power is in surrendering our spirits to God as we trust, even or maybe even especially in darkness and death. As we make our way to Easter and to the hope and promise of the resurrection, let us place ourselves in the hands of our loving Father, just as Jesus taught us to do.
When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. If you are of a certain age, you may remember the enormous controversy that was generated by Martin Scorsese's film version of Nikos Kazantzakis' novel, The Last Temptation of Christ. Much, but not all of that controversy centered on the last temptation itself. In Kazantzakis' imagination, Jesus is plagued throughout his life by doubts about his destiny and his divinity, and he is beset by temptation. Finally, as he hangs on the cross, an angel rescues him and delivers him to an ordinary human life, including marriage and children. Judas and the other disciples, now withered old men, track him down and accuse him of betraying them and betraying his mission. Cousin Zosky's words now. His head quivered. Suddenly he remembered where he was, who he was, and why he felt pain. A wild, indomitable joy took possession of him. No, no, he was not a coward, a deserter, a traitor. No, he was nailed to the cross. He has stood his ground honorably to the very end. He had kept his word. The moment he cried, Ali, Ali, and fainted, temptation had captured him for a split second and led him astray. The joys, the marriage, the children were lies. The decrepit, degraded old men who shouted coward, deserter, traitor at him, they were lies. All, all were illusions sent by the devil. His disciples were alive and thriving. They had gone over sea and land and were proclaiming the good news. Everything had turned out as it should. Glory be to God. He uttered a triumphant cry. It is accomplished. And it was as though he had said, everything is begun. Now, however you may feel about the movie or the book, to translate the traditional it is finished as it is it is accomplished is good Greek and good theology. The sense of the verb is that the purpose has been achieved and that purpose is victory over all the death-dealing powers that stalk God's good creation. God accomplishes this victory not through some epic Tolkien-esque battle. God accomplishes this victory through love. According to the Gospel of John, God incarnate, God in the flesh, has come to dwell among us in Jesus so that the unseeable God may be seen, not in any kind of physical appearance, but in the choreography of God's actions and the shape of God's love. Jesus is clear about his mission from the beginning. And just as Moses, Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now in John's Gospel, eternal life is not only the quantity of life that we may be given after we die. In John's Gospel, eternal life is the quality of life that is lived in the confident assurance of God's presence and Jesus' abiding presence right now for god so for god loved the world in this way god gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish 
but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be healed through him. Jesus willingly took the violence, the contempt, and the hatred of this world and absorbed all of that into his body. He refused to waver in his message of universal love, grace, and liberation, knowing full well that that message would cost him his life. Jesus took an instrument of torture and turned it into a vehicle of hospitality and communion for all people everywhere. He loved and he loved and he loved all the way to the end. When I am lifted up, Jesus says the last words he speaks in his public ministry in the Gospel of John. When I am lifted up, I will draw the whole world to myself. And so for those of us who despair that this world is beyond saving, that all the suffering and the loss that this world has experienced in just the last year, if we despair that nothing can be redeemed, the cross declares that redemption has been accomplished. The whole world has been healed through him, just as Jesus promised. It is accomplished. The world has been healed. And a new family has been formed. In the 12th chapter of John, Jesus also says, Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. In the Gospel of John, Fruit is the way Jesus describes the community of disciples. It is the way that Jesus describes this community called the church. One seed, Jesus' death, produces much fruit as right now in us, together, tonight. The healing power of Jesus' death now resides in us. The resurrected Christ lives in the community who bears his name and follow his follows his teaching. Jesus' death, his resurrection, and his ascension, inseparable in the Gospel of John, Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension brings forth the beloved community. It is accomplished. The seed has fallen alone into the ground, and it has produced fruit. Fruit evident here tonight as we join together in a common faith and a common scripture, as we gather together to share the message about what God has done for us and for all people. Can we do that? Can we focus on what unites us rather than what divides us? The actual existing church, says theologian Peter Rollins, has reduced the crucifixion and resurrection to religious affirmations held by a certain tribe rather than expressions of a type of life. Faith is not a set of beliefs about the world. Rather, it is found in the loving embrace of the world. In the Church of the Annunciation in Shelbyville, Kentucky, is a cross the likes of which I have never seen anywhere else. Instead of a bloodied and battered Jesus hanging on the cross, Jesus is coming off the cross with his arms outstretched before him as if coming to embrace you and to embrace me, to embrace the whole world. We who have been charged with sharing the good news of the love of God made known in Jesus Christ, we can do no less. His disciples were alive and thriving. They had gone over sea and land and were proclaiming the good news. Everything had turned out as it should. Glory be to God. He uttered a triumphant cry. It is accomplished. And it was as though he had said, everything is begun. May it be so for us also.
according to God's word. Amen. I go off script for a second. I just want, before we continue with our service, to thank the choir. The music was beautiful. Thank you. And now we enter a time of quiet reflection while Bev um, plays some soothing music for us.
And now I invite you to stand as you are able and open your bulletins to the center. Today, God makes common cause with our human suffering. Suffering is not rational and has no answer. We stand near the cross, O oh God, disturbed, distraught, discouraged. Yet we gather here as disciples, those whom Jesus loves. In the face of such suffering, show us the face of our Savior. In the shadow of such evil, show us the light of your grace. On this day of great solemnity, let us stand as witnesses to your great love for all the world, revealed in the outstretched arms of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Suffer, that they may feel your presence with them. God of mercy, we pray for those who care for those who struggle and for those who are dying, that through us you may strengthen them in their service. God of mercy, we pray for those who mourn, that they may feel your comfort as they kneel at the foot of the cross. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who wrestle with their faith, struggling to know if you are with them, that your face will not be hidden from them. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all the families and all the nations of the earth, that they shall remember and turn to you and find peace. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray in the name of our great high priest, Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. God of all, we cry out to you for help. We pray for all who have suffered and died in this last year. I invite you to pray aloud or in the silence of your heart the names for those for whom you wish to pray. We pray especially for those affected by the COVID-19 virus. God of mercy, we lift you for healing the 130 million people who have been infected. We pray you receive to your table the 2.83 million people who have died. We lift up to your mercy those who have lost jobs and homes and stability. We place into your care all experiencing isolation depression and grief. We ask your guidance for those working to distribute vaccines that the world will soon see an end to this suffering. Protect us, Lord, and be with us, especially those most vulnerable. Move us to reach out to our neighbors. Grant us the courage not to rush back to our old ways, but to rebuild our world together, creating foundations of justice with equality and peace for all. God of mercy. Please be seated. There are two tables in the middle of the church here in the middle aisle. Um, and I invite you to come forward as you feel moved to light candles for those who you would like to remember. There are some candles already lit. There are small candles on the ends of the table on plates. 
You can use the little candles in the plates to take the flame from the lit candles and light unlit candles as you pray. And then just replace the candles that you use back on the little plate so someone can come along behind you and use it again. Good and gracious God, we ask you to receive all of our prayers that we may be strengthened to do your will and live lives in your name and to your glory. Amen. Please stand and let us say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>